surrender Son of God enthroned above Heavy cross upon his shoulders Carried for us, carried for us See him now, our King surrender Final word of perfect love Hear his cry, Father forgive them Spoken for us, spoken for us When he said it is finished Oh, our hope had just begun We sing this out The grave has lost its hope God's greatness today. We're going to sing out. Death, lay your weapons down. Sin, you're defeated now. The stone is rolled away. Our God reigns. We sing crown. Crown.
you, Jesus. Let's continue lifting our worship to him this morning. He's worthy of all the praise we can give him. Amen. We sing to you, Lord. We need no other hiding place. Our hope is safe within your name. This we know. This we know. Promise never to forsake. Yeah. What you began, you will sustain. This we know. This we know. Church.
us, Lord. We're hearing our prayers. so good. Let me hear you. I love those lyrics. I love that it says it doesn't matter what I feel because we go through a lot of stuff in life, right? We go through a lot of stuff. If we had the time to talk about what's happening in your life today, 
what is going on in your world. Fear gets the best of us sometimes. Jesus tells us over and over in scripture to have faith, have no fear. Remember today that when we are filled with fear, faith takes a backseat. And sometimes we stop the car and we let faith out. Don't let faith go today. Hold on to the fact that Jesus loves you. He has not forgotten about you. He has not forgotten about you. Do you believe it? That's why we're here worshiping. And if he hasn't forgotten about us, that means there's, there's something to do. Each one of us is valuable. Each one of us is purposeful. He made you on purpose. You're here. You have breath in your lungs because he says so. So ask him what to do, Lord. What do you want me to do? Sometimes we have an imagination, a vision of, of what it might be. Sometimes our, our vision's off a little bit. Don't stop asking him. He made you for a reason. Don't give up faith. He says, I'll never leave you and I will never forsake you. So trust in that. Trust that he is with you in the journey. Isaiah says that he's holding your right hand. Whether you can feel it or not, he's with you. You know, it says in the song we were singing that I'll have no fear. Do you realize that the darkness is afraid of Jesus? The darkness is afraid of Jesus. So have no fear because even the demons know who Jesus is. They've seen him face to face and they're scared to death. They know what their eternity looks like. But do you know what your eternity looks like? Wrapped in the arms of Jesus, secure forever. So give him praise for that this morning. Give him praise.
Sing in your name, Jesus. This is the name above all names. He's our judge. He's our defender. Our judge and our defender suffered and crucified. Forgiveness is in you. He sent it into darkness. He rose in glorious light. Yeah. 
Well, good morning, Westside. Was that not awesome or what? Too good. Hey, if you enjoyed that, we want to invite you this Friday to our night of worship here at 6.30. Um, it's going to be a time, again, of just worship led by Pastor Andy, our amazing worship team. Uh, it's a chance to get together and, and sing songs of praise to him. It's a chance to just get together as a family as well, right? When we gather together, that brings joy to the heart of Lord. And so it's, uh, it's just a cool time for us. So we want to make sure you're invited to that. It starts at 6.30. Uh, it'll go for about an hour. There'll be snacks and treats and stuff like that afterwards. Just a chance to, to hang out. But we hope you uh, would join us. That's this Friday at 6.30 um, for a time of, of worship together. Um, but this morning, before we begin, I would love if you would just bow your heads and if you would pray with me uh, before we jump in. Would you do that? God, we thank you for today. Uh, we thank you for uh, who you are. Thank you for the fact that we can believe in you, God, that we can trust you with our hearts, that we can sing songs of praise, songs of worship to you, God, but uh, things that bring you glory also worship you, God. Um, the, the skills, the abilities that you've given us, God, that we use them um, to make you known. Um, it's another form of worship, and so we're just so thankful for that. Father, we pray for uh, your words today, not mine. We pray for open hearts and open ears to receive what you would have for us, and we give you these next few moments. So, God, we love you, we praise, and we thank you in your name. Amen. Awesome. Well, good morning again. My name is uh, Andrew Clark. I'm the youth pastor here, uh, and so it is always a joy of mine to come and speak to the old kids every once in a while um, and, and get away from the stinky kids. And so um, I'm excited. We did a little event called Dodgeball and Donuts last night. Um, it's exactly how it sounds. We played dodgeball and ate donuts. And so um, I'm a little sore uh, but it's all right. It was a good time. And uh, I'm excited this morning because um, we're going to be talking about butts. And, like, <laughs> like I, was, I wasn't going to make butt jokes, but I was like, maybe I should title this message, like, God likes big butts, right? But I was like, I don't know if God, I don't know if I can, like, say that in church. So I didn't. So it's just titled butt. And, like, one T, not two Ts, all right? I got all the butt jokes out, so we're good. But we're talking about butts. Uh, for a lot of us, right, that phrase butt has so many different meanings, okay? Like that, that phrase in a sentence, it is used to, to basically tell the opposite of what you just said. It's a contrasting conjunction, right? It's, it's used in a sentence to say, I was going to, but I was scared, or I didn't, or I couldn't, right? That's what it's used for. There's, there's positives, right? There, there's, I used to be this way, but now I'm better, now I'm this way, right? But for a lot of us, but seems to have this negative connotation, a, a negative sort of meaning to it, right? It's, there's, it's connected to doubt. It can be connected to fear. It can be connected to anxiety. It can be connected to uh, an unwillingness, right? It can be connected to a side of us that just says, I cannot complete what I wanted to do, right? I, I would have, I could have, I should have, I wanted to, I thought about, I, I was going to. But fear, doubt, anxiety, unwillingness, unskilled, whatever it may be, but has allowed us to, to kind of make excuses. Right? It's almost become like a, a get out of jail free card, right? It's, it's allowed us to avoid the, the repercussions of a choice I made, right? I, I, I tried to do it, but I, I couldn't. I, I didn't, right? So you can't be mad at me because I, I couldn't, right? That's what but has become. And, and I think it's an important word because I, I feel like it's just used every day, all the time. In Scripture, in the Bible, I, I did a quick Google search, and it's, it's used 3,983 times that singular word appears in Scripture. I feel like once a day or, or every day, I use the word but 3,983 times, right? It's just kind of part of our language. It's what we use to describe. It's, it's what we use to, to kind of put a wall up. It's what we use to just keep us protected. But this morning, I, my goal is that we would look at this word and, and how can it actually be changed to a positive? How can our language, our, our grammar actually be changed to mean something positive? And so we're going to be reading about a, a group of guys named Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, right? Rakshak and Benny. You've probably heard of them before. And, and we're going to talk about them in, in this thing called the fiery furnace, right? This burning. It's in Daniel chapter 3. You can turn there in your Bibles. We'll eventually have it on the screen for you. But you got to understand something. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they were friends with a man named Daniel. And Daniel 
was connected to a king named Nebuchadnezzar. In the first part of Daniel, we read about this king named Nebuchadnezzar who just was kind of a weird dude. He wanted everyone to worship gods, any other gods, and he, he had nothing to do with the God of, 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 of us, right? He said, that's not real. This is not the God I want you to worship. And in Daniel, we read about the fact that he begins to have these dreams. And Daniel has these, or, or Nebuchadnezzar has these really wild dreams where he's picturing these large statues made of gold and iron and clay and bronze, right? And he's, he's really, really thrown off by what it means, why am I thinking of these large statues? Why am I, it's a large man statue too, right? So he sends out a royal decree. He says, I need all the wisest people in the land to show up and tell me what my dream means. Well, in this time, the people of Babylon, the, the wisest people of Babylon said, hey, we're, we don't know what you're dreaming about, what you're thinking about, buddy. Like they're, they're very much just straight up with them. Like this is not something we can do. So Nebuchadnezzar, being like a royal and just king, is like, all right, everyone dies, okay? Like, that's zero to 100 real, real quick. Like, that's his mindset. It's like, you can't tell me what it is. You should probably just be dead, okay? So that's, that's what we get to. And then all of a sudden, Daniel shows up and says, hey, I know how to tell you what your dream means. And so Daniel and Nebuchadnezzar have this conversation. Daniel explains to him what it means, explains to him that, that God is actually the one who's helping interpret this dream. Nebuchadnezzar being just filled with almost joy and, and, and excitement that now he knows what's going on, actually begins to, to praise and, and give praise to God. It's kind of this really cool moment. And then Nebuchadnezzar, again, just being like the really straight up stand up guy he is, he's like, you guys are on my team now, and hey, go build me a 90 foot by 9 foot wide statue made of gold. And everyone's going to worship that. Because that's what you just told me my dream meant, and it was not even close. But Nebuchadnezzar's a little crazy. So this is where we're at in Daniel chapter 3, is now this interaction has happened. Daniel is on the council of Nebuchadnezzar. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are also on this council. They're kind of close with Nebuchadnezzar. The statue has been built, seriously, 90 feet tall by 9 feet wide. That's huge, taller than me, has been built. And it's decided that everyone and anyone must bow down and worship this thing every day. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego said, hey, we're not about that. that does, that's not who our God is. We want nothing to do it. We will not bow down and worship your statue. Nebuchadnezzar being so upset, he says, bring him to me, fire up the furnace, and we're just going to burn him, right? This guy seems totally sane, okay? So he's like, we're just going to burn him. And that's where we pick up in Daniel chapter 3. So Daniel chapter 3, verses 16 uh, through 18 says this. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to him, King Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to deliver us from it, and he will deliver us from your majesty's hand. But even if he does not, but even if he does not, we want you to know, your majesty, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold that you have set up. This infuriates Nebuchadnezzar. He actually takes the furnace and ratchets it up another seven times hotter, throws the men in, and if you know anything about the stories you read on, as these three men fall into the fire, a fourth appears. Right? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are brought out of the fire, not burned, not, nothing wrong with them, and this just freaks Nebuchadnezzar out, and he says, your God must be who you says he is. But this is baffling to me, and this is crazy to me, because you got to understand something real quick. This furnace that we're talking about was one of two things. It was either a really deep pit, or it was kind of a stone built up, like, top to it, made of, um, made of bricks, right? So they were pushed into this. They were tied together and thrown into this. Uh, scholars believe that it was, at its coolest, 1,500 degrees. When you talk about it being ratcheted up seven times hotter, that means it probably was a white hot flame at least, which means it's now over 3,000 degrees. So if you want to think about it in this terms, if you were to go and touch a 1,500 degree fire, you got about 20-ish, 40 seconds before you die, okay? Where you're just baking, okay? Like that's how we're working. So now if we're talking at 3,000 degrees, this fire is closer to this. Dead. You got lucky, 
dead, right? It's, that's how quick you're dead. And this fire was probably hotter than even that. It's so hot that it says the guards actually approach it, and as they are stoking the fire, stroking the fire, making it hotter, they actually burn up and die instantly as well. Like, this is a crazy, like, I've experienced some really hot days in my life. Like, who's been sunburned? Let's be honest. My skin tone is sunburn or pale, okay? Like, I've been sunburned so many times. Like, I have, like, the weird thing on my stomach. Like, if it gets tan, it gets, like, splotchy tanned. Like, that's messed up. But anyways, like, I'm like that, but I have a younger brother named John Michael who's, like, even paler, right? He's gotten so sunburned. One year in Canada... For like three days, we just stayed outside, right? Just that summer, it's like a little over 90 degrees, sun at the highest point. We forget what suntan lotion is or whatever blankets are and just need to wear clothes at this point. Forget all that stuff, running around. He had welts, boils, blisters, like in less than a day up here that were over like a 50 cent piece size and about an inch thick. We named it Bubby. He just became part of the family. That was my little, little, I miss him, right? Like, that's who it was. It was to the point where, like, you popped it with a knife and, like, it shot stuff. Like, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> TMI. My apologies. But, yo, it was hot, and it was hot enough to cause that issue. We were also dumb enough to cause, but still, it was hot enough to cause that kind of messed up thing on our skin. Does not whatsoever compare to what these men had to go through. And yet as they fall into the fire, they're brought out. No burns, no nothing. They're saved. It's a pretty awesome story of of really the grace of God, right? But as we read this, we begin to understand that I want to kind of focus in, though, on on Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego's, their mentality towards what's about to happen. Right? If we go back to the scripture when it says this, when it says uh, he's going to save us, he's, he's going to bring us out. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able He is able to deliver us from it. But even if he does not. See, that statement right there, but even if he does not, is so faith-packed. Because think about it. For a lot of us, faith is this. It's it's so uh, connected to our senses, right? It's what we're feeling, it's what we're seeing, it's what we're going through. Yet faith is belief in what you cannot see. Yet faith happens to be circumstantial for some of us. I I believe the healing can happen. I I believe the provision will come through. I I believe God will, but we begin to have this thought of, 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 of but. But what if it doesn't? But, but what if the healing doesn't happen? But what if this mistake I made ends up being a really bad mistake? What, what, but, but. See, the, the but I language that we have contradicts the faith that we should have. Because for faith, faith is this. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego could have fallen into that fire and become a nice barbecue. And God is still God. See, their faith statement is saying, we believe he will deliver us. We believe he will come through. We have faith in what he says he can do. But even if he does not, he is still God. And it's the same for you and I today. God is still God today as he was yesterday and as he will be forevermore. That is who God is. But do we have the faith to actually believe that? Because faith should actually begin to change our language. Faith should begin to change it from but I, but I tried, but I wanted to, but I could have to but God. Because everything we've wanted to do, God can do. Right, look at this. Scripture is full of but God statements. Genesis 50, 50, 20 says this. You intended it to harm me, but God intended it to accomplish what is being done. Savings of many lives. 1 Kings 5, 4. But now the Lord my God has given me rest on every side, and there is, adverse, there is no adversary or disaster. Matthew 19, 26. Jesus looked at them and said, With man this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. See, faith changes our language. 
Faith changes it from what I wanted to do and what I could do, but to I tried, but God did. I thought about it, but God comes through. See, one of my favorite but God verses is actually Romans 6.23. See, for me, Romans 6.23 is a perfect illustration of what our faith should look like and how we come about faith. We actually work with our students and elevate a lot with this verse because it encapsulates the gospel, the good news of what Jesus Christ did. But it says this, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. So I, when I read that scripture, I, I actually view two cliffs, two cliff edges, and we stand on one side, right? And the cliff edge that we're made on uh, starts like this. It starts with our wages. Well, what's a wage? A wage is anything earned because of the work you did, right? I have to put an effort in to get something in return. With no work, there comes no wage. So it's everything I am working for. A wage is what I am earning for that work. That starts it. But what wages, what exactly are we earning? Well, where it says the wages of sin. Well, what is sin? Sin is actually an archery term that means to miss the mark. Right? Sin is an arch return. It means to miss the mark. It means I aimed for the bullseye. I wanted to hit the bullseye, but I went just right, just left of center. I, I just keep missing the mark. So everything I have worked for has earned me nothing but this, missing the mark. I could have had the best of intentions, and yet I find myself missing the mark. It says, for the wages of sin is what? Death. So the missing the mark has earned me nothing but death. But what is death? <coughs> Excuse me. Death is nothing. Death is the removal of hope. Death means that when you and I die, we die. Death is the end. So on this cliff that I've built myself on, it says everything I have worked for has done nothing but earn me missing the mark, and that missing the mark has caused me death, end. No hope, it's over. But the gift of God is eternal life. Well, what is a gift? A gift is something freely given and freely received. A gift is to say, I, I did nothing to deserve this. And it was given to me. Someone cared enough to know what I wanted and they got it for me. <clears throat> that is a gift. But who gives that gift? God. Who is God? Well, if we read, God is the creator. He's the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end. He is the savior. He is the father. He is the head, right? He is everything. So on this side, we have these gifts given to us by this man who is a savior, who is the creator by the great and almighty father, right? And what is the gift he is trying to give us? Eternal life. And what is eternal life? It is the opposite of death. It is hope. It is the thought that when this world comes to an end and we take our last breath, there is abundantly more waiting for us. It means it does not end here. It means there is a hope that I have a future. And I have something to look forward to. So for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. That's awesome. Doesn't that look awesome? I, I want to be on this side. right? I, I want to be where the gifts of God are. I want to have that hope. But anything you and I do does not get us to that side. Because as we've talked about, everything you and I have done and everything we have did and everything we do just gets us nothing. But I love that the verse doesn't stop there. It says what? For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. So who is Jesus Christ to you and I? For us, Jesus is the one who came and went to the cross and paid the debt that we owed. He paid off all those wages, everything that we've earned, right? He came in and said, it's clean. You are forgiven. And us putting our faith in him 
leads us to the other side. And it is only through him. Scripture says it is by no other means but through the Lord Jesus Christ that you receive the gift of God that is eternal life. You see, when faith changes our language to but I, or from but I to but God, our mindset begins to change. Our mindset says, I get it. I, I've done this. I'm tired of saying I wish I would have, but I could have done it, but. And I just want to say, but God can. God does. God will. He has. He wants to. This is who God is. Romans 5, 8 says this, but God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So while you and I were stuck, while you and I were, 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 were trying to do it on our own, he stepped in and said, I have given you the way. See, this morning, I want to help you find that hope. Right, would you bow your heads this morning? Would you close your eyes? No one looking around. This is just your moment. Because I believe for a lot of us, there's this, there's this, the reality for us that we've tried. We've wanted to. I, I, I've thought about it. I, I thought I was there. And, and you are here this morning with a chance to say, I tried, but God did. So this morning, if you're looking for that hope, I want to offer a prayer that you can pray. It is not the prayer that saves you, it is the belief in our Lord Jesus Christ that saves you. But it goes like this, if this is you, you can pray this with me. It says, God, I realize that I have messed up. I realize that I am a sinner, and I realize that I need a Savior. I can no longer do this on my own. God, I recognize that you are that Savior. So God, I repent. I ask for forgiveness of the things that I have done, the mistakes that I have made for trying to do this on my own. And I receive you as my Lord and Savior forevermore. Man, if you prayed that this morning, will you just slip your hand up? That's awesome. Praise God. God, we love you. We thank you. We praise the way that you appreciate us, God, the way that you've, you've set your son, that you offer us a chance to find hope, to find an eternity in you. So God, we love you, we thank you. God, we're excited to jump out of this grave and run to you, God. Father, we give you all the praise in your name. Amen.
this morning. We love you, Jesus. We praise you for your life in us, Lord. You guys have a great week. I'm going to see you right here Friday night, 630. Let's worship together then. Have a great week. Love you.